gathering evidence from your five senses, which God gave us our five senses, right? But when it comes to faith, how many know the Bible says the sense-led mind in Romans chapter 8 is, is an enemy, the carnal mind, that's what carnal means, is an enemy to God. In other words, you're constantly gathering evidence from your five senses, which is unrelenting, or from the Word of God. And so that's why it's imperative that we're in the Word and we begin to use our, here it is, boy, the Lord was really hitting on me with this this morning, your imagination, you're using your imagination all the time, right? How many people can picture your unmade bed or your made bed? Right? You can see it right now. That's your imagination. God gave your imagination. And the Lord was showing me even this morning uh, out of Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3, God will keep him in perfect peace or shalom shalom in Hebrew whose imagination, the English says mine, is stayed upon him because he trusts in him. Your imagination, you begin to see yourself in the promises of God. You begin to recognize how you would feel if that was true in your life, if the manifestation was there. See, you can't go anywhere on the outside that you don't first see on the inside. We need to start using our imagination that God gave us to see ourselves in the promise. And if you see it on the inside, we'll see it on the outside. Amen. But see, a lot of times we don't do that. We don't unplug long enough to go to the heart zone. See, imagination is not new age. It's God's creation. See, New Age and all them kind of groups, they just pervert stuff. Trust me, I know. And then they want you to dismiss your imagination. I remember when I was driving bus, and I would get, you know, sub-bus drivers, one of the hardest jobs in the world, because you don't know where you're going. You have to, you, you, but you picture it in your mind. You picture your next stop. Well, okay, I'll go here, and then I go here, and then I go here. In other words, you get a, you get, you're using your imagination to help you run that route. And, you know, God is calling us to use our imagination to begin to see ourselves in the answer right now. How would you feel if that healing was manifested in your life right now? See, you're gathering evidence, either from your senses, from what people tell you, you name it, or from what God says. We need to gather more evidence. See, I think faith is easier than we've made it. I think what makes it hard is we don't go to the heart zone. We're trying to believe with our head instead of our heart. God is a heart God. He, we, we relate to Him from the heart, not the head. Praise God. You already got it started, right? Good. Because I wanted that on. Praise the Lord of glory. If you have your uh, outlines, we will get started. My word, this is good. This is, this is uh, the title of this message is Show Your Redemption Receipt. Show Your Redemption Receipt. How many of you know when somebody comes up to you in a story, how many know it's a good idea to keep the receipt? Right? You didn't pay for that. Oh, yes, I did. You show them your receipt, right? You know, with the things of God, we need to show the spiritual realm our redemption receipt. And a lot of people don't do this. This is just what I was talking about, going to the heart zone, seeing yourself in the promise of God, seeing the fact that Jesus paid for it all, identifying with what he did instead of with what you're doing. Man's religion always wants to make our identity what we're doing or what we're not doing instead of what he did. True Christianity make, causes the believer to identify with what Jesus did in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Amen. All right. With that said, I'm going to start off, not with your outline, but I want to start off with Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. Do you know that you can frustrate the grace of God? Do you know you can nullify the grace of God? Do you know that you can void out the grace of God? Do you know that when Paul had wrote this, he was writing to believers, not to unbelievers? Now, I'm going to talk about how you nullify the grace of God. That's going to be where we're going to start. And then we're going to get into identifying with him. This is going to rock Rock, rock. Rock, rock. <laughs> All right. I, Paul says, through the Holy Spirit, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Watch this. For if righteousness came by the law or through the law or through my performance, then Christ died for nothing. Now watch this. How do you frustrate? First of all, what does it mean to frustrate the grace of God? I want, you, I want to read this to you. The word frustrate means it's in the present tense, which means it's a continuous action. You know, believers continually be frustrating the grace of God, voiding it out, nullifying it. You know, a lot of people do. You know how they frustrate the grace of God? You want the answer? Hang with me. Just hang with me. Next week. I'm kidding. <laughs> I got that joke from Joseph Prince. No. Uh, frustrate means uh, to do away with. To do away with the grace of God? Wait a minute, doesn't it just come independently of, of my response? No. You've got to cooperate with the grace of God. I'm going to show you in just a second, this is going to prep us, how believers frustrate the grace of God. They do away with it in their life. 
Galatians 5, 4, Christ can become of no effect unto you and I if we're justified by our performance instead of what he did. Justified means I do stuff to earn. Notice when we receive the offering, notice how I say it, very intentional. Jesus has already blessed me, but this giving is my act of faith that agrees with what he said, that I'm blessed. But my, I don't give to get, I give because I got that's a reality. Now watch this. To frustrate means to do away with. It means to set aside. You can set aside the grace of God. It means to disregard the grace of God. Wow. It means to thwart the efficiency, efficiency of a thing. I looked up efficiency. It means the ability to produce a desired or intended result. I can thwart the ability of God's grace to produce a desired or intended result? Wow. I want to know what this is. How about you? I do too. It means to uh, nullify. You can nullify the grace of God. It means to make void the grace of God. It means to frustrate. It means to reject the grace of God. It means to refuse it or to slide it. Now, how do I do that? I'm glad you ask. You do that as you go to verse 20, the verse before that. We frustrate the grace of God when we try to live for God. God never called you and I to live for Him. Oh, Chris, now you're getting in. No, you never did. He, what our job is, our goal is, is to allow Him to live through us. Amen. Now, this, I know in case you think I'm splitting hairs, I'm not. Most of the body of Christ teaches us to live for God. Dedicating my life for God is letting Him live through me. That's why Paul said in Colossians 1.27, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. You. We don't live for God. We learn to let Him live through us. Like the boy trying to float on water. His dad would float on water and almost fall asleep. He learned that when he learned to let the water carry Him. That's why it's called the fruit of the Spirit. That's why we have our time with God. We get God's mind. How do you want to flow through me today? I'm not working for you. You're working through me. Christ is working in me, both to will and to do of His good pleasure, Philippians 2 tells us. What does that mean? He puts the desire in us, and then He puts the ability in us. All we do is say yes and respond. Amen. Big difference. Big difference. Day and night difference. And if you don't know the difference, you need to know the difference. The way we frustrate God's grace, lay it aside, nullify it, void it, reject it, you know, cause it not to produce the desired or intended result is when we try to live for God instead of allowing God, Christ in us, to live through us. That's how we do it. That's how we do it. That's how we do it. I mean, it's so subtle. That's what Paul was dealing with in this entire book. They're starting the book of Galatians in the Bible study. That's exciting. Because the whole book of Galatians is basically saying you got saved by what Jesus has done and now you're going to go back to your own human effort? Right, right. Yeah. That's why people fail. That's why you've got to have revival. I don't need revival. I'm vibed. Hello. I'm in vival. <laughs> I don't need revived. I'm vibed. How about you? Amen. And it keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Amen. 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 We're not earning, we're learning. Learning what? What he did. Right. Yes. Amen. All right. So, now watch this. He says, I, I want to finish this and then we'll get to the outline. He, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Now, this is so fascinating. Now, the, I think it's the New King James says, I have been crucified. And I've heard people split hairs. Very simple. They both work. The word, I am crucified, one Greek word, it means to crucify along with. We're going to get into that. Learning to identify how to show your redemption receipt. His death was your death. His burial was your burial. His resurrection was your resurrection. He did it in your place. Identify with him. Now watch this. I am crucified means to crucify along with. This is so fascinating. The Greek, it's in the Greek perfect tense. What's the perfect tense? A present state as a result of a past action with continuous results. I have been crucified with Christ. Amen. Amen? A present state because of a past action with continuous result. And it's in the passive voice. The passive voice means the subject, you and I, receives this position. Oh, glory to God. No wonder Paul said in Galatians 6, 14, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world and its way of doing things is crucified unto me and I unto the world. 
I don't approach God based on me. I approach it based on Him. I approach God based on Him. Now watch this. Passive voice. And it's in the indicative mood. What does that mean? This is a fact. That's a strong, emphatic way of saying, this is fact. That's your position. I am crucified, have been crucified right now with Christ. I've been crucified. Continuous state as a result of a past action with continuous results. I've received it and it's a fact with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not me, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Whoa, His faith. Whoa. <laughs> who loved me and gave himself for me, I do not frustrate, nullify, or lay aside, or void out, or reject the grace of God. Because if righteousness comes any other way, by my own merit, external merit, then Christ is of no effect in my life. Glory to God. Good stuff. All right, moving right along. All right, go to your outline. This is, where, this is the first thing. His death. Look, look on the first page there. And there's, there's some blanks. His death sets you free from the curse of the law and the punishment you deserve. What is the curse of the law? Anybody know? The curse of the law said that if you don't do this, then there, or if you don't measure up here, if you uh, miss it here, then there's consequences from God because you missed it. How many know we all missed it? How many know Romans says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? And that's why Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, Cursed is everyone who's under this law mentality who doesn't continue and fulfill everything he needs to fulfill or otherwise he needs to put his faith in a Savior. See, this is an ongoing process. We do it once, but we continue to... We have to keep our faith in Him. When Jesus taught about abiding in Him, the vine, you know what He was saying? Keep your faith in me and what I've done. This is how I flow. You know what stops the flow? When I start going back to me again. When I start going back to my effort, my this, my this. The, listen, it's about Him. That's why it's good news. That's why we praise the Lord. I'm going to praise my way in. Been there, done that, and got the t-shirt. Been there, done that. Praise your way in. I'm already in. I'm in Christ. I'm born again. I praise Him from completeness, not to become complete. Watch it. His death. I'm, we're going to talk about identifying with His death his burial, and his resurrection. Predominantly today, we're going to talk about his death. His death sets you free from the curse of the law and the punishment you deserved. His burial is the burial of all you are outside, goes in that blank, of Christ. All that you are outside of Christ is buried. Glory to God. Glory to God. See, but if you don't, once again, as I said earlier, we're constantly gathering evidence, either from our five senses, from our past memories, all those types of things. But if you, that's why you have to gather your evidence from the Word of God. When the Bible says faith is the substance of what you're hoping for, the evidence of what you haven't seen, faith where? Faith in the Word of God. Faith in what God says. You know, God loves me the same as He loves Jesus. Now that's blasphemy, brother. Well, let me show it to you. John 17, 23. Jesus' prayer. Watch this. How many believe Jesus got his prayers answered? Hello. I do too. John 17, verse 23. Look at it. I and them, this is Jesus praying, I and them, thou, Father, in me, that they may be made perfect or complete in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, oh, look at this, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. The same love that God the Father has for Jesus is the same love He has for you and I. My word, receive it. You know what blesses God? When you take the limits off God and start believing big because Christ is in you, the hope of glory. He's the hope of God's manifestation. What's His glory? It's His goodness and you can't even define it. It's so big. In Exodus chapter 34, when, when Moses said, show me your glory, and God said, listen, I'll, you can only see the backside and I'll make, I'll make all of my goodness pass before you. That's his glory. But guess what? In the New Testament, we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you see Jesus in the Word of God, you've seen the Father. If you start using your God-given imagination and start seeing yourself as God's favorite instead of somebody that God's just putting up with. Well, uh, Billy Graham, I can see that, or Creflo Dollar, or Andrew, or Joseph, or whoever. No, you! 
You're limiting God when you start comparing yourselves among one another and making them the big I and you the little you. My word, that's good. God loves you as much as He loves Jesus. And He wants you to receive that. That's why He said one. If His love for you is anything less than you, His love for Jesus is less than yours. Woo! Look at that. Glory to God. My word, that'll put a shout in a corpse. <laughs> I mean, look at this. This is so good. So good. His burial, the burial of all you are outside of Christ. And His resurrection is all that's yours before, because you are in Christ and share His inheritance. Now look at this. Romans chapter 4, verse 25. And then Galatians 4, 7, quickly. And then we'll get right, right down the, the outline. A receipt is an, a written acknowledgement that a special article has been received or paid for. You have a receipt. Jesus was delivered for our offenses, for our sins, but he didn't stop there. He was raised for our justification, or our declaration that we are the righteousness of God in him. Okay, you got that? Okay, so we're talking about identifying with his death, which has set us free from the curse of the law, and the punishment that we deserved. And the punishment we deserve. Why don't we deserve punishment? See, God does everything judicially. Because He took the punishment. Yeah, thank you. He took the punishment. Thank you. Yeah. He took the punishment. The burial of all that we are outside of Christ and the resurrection, all that's ours because we are in Christ and share His inheritance. Galatians 4, 7, quickly. This is so powerful. I love this. Watch this. What is our inheritance? Galatians, Romans is good though. Galatians 4, 7. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant. Does that mean we don't serve? No, we serve, but we serve out of love. We're serving sons and daughters. You're, but, but under the old covenant, they were just servants. They weren't sons. They weren't in the family. God and sons and daughters. Not gender specific. Thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, look at this, then an heir of the things of God through Christ. Notice it doesn't say that. I just misread it. Not an heir of the things of God, an heir of God. Woo! An heir of God? I didn't say it, God said it. An heir of God? Who are you? Who do you think you are? Let me tell you who I think I am. A child of God, a child of the King. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. This is how powerful it is to show your receipt. Ephesians chapter number 3 and verse 10. If I can get it unhooked here, I'm going to read something to you. Look at this. This gets so good. Ephesians 3 and verse 10. Notice what it says. To the intent that now, somebody say now, now. under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Listen to Kenneth Weiss, the Greek scholar, what he says about this verse. Are you ready? The principalities and powers, he lists as the angels of God, and it includes that, but I also believe it's the demonic powers. Amen. Now watch this. He, this is what he says. The church thus has become the university for angels, and each saint a professor. Only in the church, the unified body of Christ, can the angels come to an adequate comprehension of the grace of God. They look at the church to investigate the mysteries of redemption. 1 Peter 1.12 speaks of things which the angels have a passionate desire to stoop down and look into, like the golden cherubim that overshadowed the mercy seat, ever gazing upon the sprinkled blood that is upon it. The preposition para or beside is prefixed to the verb stoop down, which speaks of the angels as spectators, viewing the great plan of redemption from the sidelines, not being participants in it. Do you know that you're a professor? You're a professor to the realm, the spiritual realm. And, and see, that's why Satan loves lies. He loves you to believe a lie. He loves you to identify with yourself and not to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Well, you're just an old this. Listen, that's buried. That died in Christ. Amen. Praise God. Now look at your uh, outline here. Number one example. Show your receipt. Somebody say, show your receipt. A receipt is, is proof of payment. Say, proof of payment. Look at Ephesians 1, 7. We're going to go quick because this is so good. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through His blood. Now, do we have redemption or are we trying to get redemption? What is redemption? I'm glad you ask. Redemption is a releasing affected by the payment 
of a ransom. The devil and the demonic realm cannot hold you hostage unless you don't know who you are. Unless you don't know who you are. And that's how a lot of us are. You've all heard the story. Who's ever seen an elephant? Yeah. A big elephant. You've all heard the story about a baby elephant. I remember one time going to a zoo and they were cleaning the elephants and they had one in this big, thick bar. They were like this. And this elephant was just a massive animal. Massive animal. And, 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 but the little baby elephant, when, they, when they, they chain it to a little pole, when it's little and it pulls and it pulls and it can't, it can't get loose, that elephant will grow up and in its mind it still thinks it can't break that rope even though it could snap it like a thread. That's the way a lot of Christians are. A lot of Christians still think that they're a sinner saved by grace. If you're born again, you're not a sinner saved by grace. You're the righteousness of God in Him. You're loved as a son of the Most High God and you have a right to the things of God and you need to start declaring it, but you need to start seeing it in your heart saying, this is who I am. This is who I am. Well, it just don't look. I tried that once. You don't try this. It's who you are. This isn't like trying a pair of shoes. Oh, they don't fit. I want a different one. <laughs> no. Amen. Redemption. Look at this. Ephesians 1, 7. In whom we have. Somebody say, I have. Redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Ransom is, it's paid for. It's paid for. When it says we have redemption, this is so good. It means to, in Greek, it means to have, to hold, to own. How many of you own your redemption? How many of you know if you've got a receipt for something, that means it's paid for? Own it. Own it. See, some people think, well, I don't want to be cocky. Well, our, see, our view of humility is so warped. Humility is when you have a boldness because it's what God did. If people think that's pride, they're the ones that are messed up. Well, I'm just humble. No, that's self-focused. See, when you're God-focused, you're humble. When you're self-focused, you're in pride. There's a good definition. See, we, we have this view of it. Well, I don't want to think too big. God's been really dealing with me about that. Stop thinking too little. When you think too little, you're limiting it to you. Say that. Amen. Amen. You're limiting it to you and God doesn't want that. Amen. Well, it's everyone else's fault. There's another trick of the enemy. Just read a thing recently. As long as you blame everyone else for your own failures, you'll never be successful or you'll, you'll never succeed until they succeed. As long as it's everybody else's fault for my failures, I'll never be successful until they're successful. You can't control what other people did. The only one we have to look at is Jesus, and he was successful. And when we put our faith in his success, that's our success. Amen. Glory to God. God wants us to think bigger. Amen. Stop limiting God to yourself. Start unlimiting him to Jesus. You know, God wants you to change the world. I mean, somebody's like, well, no, that was the Protestant reformer, Martin Luther, or, or Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., or some other famous person. No, no, you. Do you know in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, it talks in the Hall of Fame of Faith how they literally changed their generations through faith, and it lists the Old Testament saints. And do you know that you have a greater covenant than all the Old Testament saints put together because yours is in Christ? And God wants you to change your generation through faith? Right. This CR thing, man, I'm telling you, it's lost. God's doing something. Yes. Every time I try to... I, I don't know... I hear myself talk, well, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. And then I say it. You know, <laughs> because God's trying to rip the limits off of us. Yeah, thank you. Praise God. We have it. We have redemption. We possess it. We, it means to hold. It's all in your outline. Hold oneself to a thing, to lay hold, to adhere to. Redemption. The word redemption, here it is again. It means a releasing affected by the payment of a ransom. If you're sin conscious, you're basically saying Jesus didn't do his job. It means deliverance. Now watch this. I'm not going to go over all these for the sake of time, but they're in your outline. You, you, can, you can look at them. Go down to number two. We were dead in sin, and now we are dead to sin. Now let me define sin for you. See, because we always think sin, well, I know what that is, smoking and dipping and chewing and going with girls who do. No, sin means to miss the mark. It means to come short of the glory of God. It means to not identify with Him. 
All sin, when we, we acts of sin are based on a heart belief that you're missing it or lacking it in some area, so you've got to do something or not do something to somehow fulfill that void in your heart. So sin means coming short of the glory of God. But watch this. We were dead in sin, so, but now we're dead to sin. And look at this. The scripture references are there. I've got to go fast, so I'm not going to go over all these. Jesus did not come to make bad people good, but to make dead people alive. You got that? Jesus didn't come. Well, you're bad. Now I'm going to make you good. He came to me. See, the, the problem was this people were dead in sins. There's the verses, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. But he quickened us and made us alive. That's what I said. We were dead in sin. Now we're dead to sin. Sin cannot dominate us, for we're not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6, 14. Now, hang with me. I got two, two major points I want to cover in this message. That's why I'm moving, okay? And I, I, I believe the Lord showed me. You can see this in Ephesians chapter, or excuse me, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. I'm going to just do verse 11. Verse 11. And then, then we'll go to our, Ephesians 1, or 6, verse 11. Watch this. What did I say, Ephesians? I meant Romans. If you were led of the Spirit, you would have got that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm teasing. Romans 6, 11. Roman, oh, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Now this word reckon is not because Paul was from the south. <laughs> Some of you are going, oh, oh I get it now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Just act like it's funny. All right. <laughs> the word reckon there means, it, it, it means it's a Greek word, logizomai, and it means to account. It's an accounting term. It means to take into inventory. But look at this. It's in the present tense. Middle passive voice, which means you're receiving it, but it's imperative that you invent when you inventory yourself, you reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. That's talking about the nature of sin. Sin is an entity. You're dead to that. You don't miss the mark in Christ. You don't miss the mark in Christ. In our actions we do, in our words we do, but the more we identify here, the more we don't miss it in Him. Now watch this. But you're dead indeed unto sin, but alive. Unto God through Jesus Christ the Lord. So account yourself to be dead indeed unto sin continually, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how God wants us to see ourselves. Now, here's what we're after. First Corinthians. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna read this to you. Okay, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to start with verse 23. This is the communion table. Now, I know we all think we all know about communion, and that's wonderful that we already know everything about it, but I just happen to continue to keep learning. So I'm going to share some of the things that I believe God put on my heart to help you to keep learning. We're talking about identifying with His death, burial, and resurrection. Primarily His death at this point. Okay? In order to receive resurrection life, you've got to understand that something has died. In order to be resurrected, there has to be a death, correct? Everybody got that? All right, now watch this. And we're going to see it right here. The Lord showed me this. When we say communion table, it's not about eating a little wafer or a little cracker and drinking a little cup of juice, okay? It's about identifying with the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what it's about, right? And as I talk about this, uh, I, I want you to know that it's not just when you're taking communion. It's all the time, okay? Now watch this. Now, Communion or, or taking the, the, the wafer and the cup, if you do it in faith in what Jesus did, not looking at yourself, it has that, it's, it's an act of faith. Just like I said earlier, our giving, we don't give to get, we give because we believe we're blessed. And giving is our act of faith that says, I believe that. Faith without action, works, corresponding action is dead, correct? Everybody got that? All right, everybody got that. See, we got to get this. The Bible says in Hebrews 9 that he's, he's purged our conscience, not from works, but from dead works. Any work that I offer to God to try to earn something that's been freely given me in Christ. All right? You can make anything a dead work. Did you know that? We can make taking communion. Well, I take communion. I take communion because I got to take communion. You're missing the whole point. You're taking it unworthily. In other words, it does no good. It's just a little bit of juice and a little cracker. Okay? When we take it worthily, we're putting faith in what He did. What He did in our place. What He did as us. Ooh, getting into some heavy identity there. Now watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to say a lot of things here, so hang with me. Where am I at? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and it says, uh, verse 23. 
For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. This is Paul talking. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Next verse. And when he had given thanks, but there's, there's so much revelation here. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now, we've talked about this. I want to just hit on it. When we take communion, we don't do it in remembrance of you and your performance. We do it in remembrance of him and what he did at the cross. Everybody got that? For years and years and years, I thought it was about judging myself and making sure I'm living good, good enough. Correct? Wrong. In fact, one of the guys that I fellowship with, and they said, well, they taught on communion this week. And so I started probing him. Well, what did you teach? What did you teach on communion? Because I know if you believe like I used to believe, it was all about me. And it, I didn't do it in remembrance of Jesus. It was in remembrance of me. How I did last week. <laughs> well, we walk around. Just, you know, I just want you to know, Doug, I had something against you, man. I'm sorry. Really? I didn't know that. Now I got something against you. <laughs> How to have a church split. Step one, take communion the old way. <laughs> no. right. But see, that's how we do it. The Jesus said, do it in remembrance of me. Next verse. The same, after the same manner, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the new covenant, the new testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of, of who? Of him. Once again, in remembrance of him. Now, here we go. Next verse. For as often, oh, this is so good. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, oh, this is so loaded, you do show or shew, the old King James it means show the Lord's death when, until he comes. For, you know what I used to think that was? I used to think that was referring to the second coming of Jesus. It's not. Now, I believe in the second coming of Jesus. But this is not parousia. This is, not, this is, this is urchomai. Now, and why show the Lord's death? What about his resurrection? Why just his death? And what does it mean until he comes? Aren't, do you ever have questions like this? I'm going to show you. Watch this. Wow, this is so good. Until he comes. Look at this. Look at your, your outline there. You show what? His death until he comes. You show the receipt that your sins are paid for in his blood. You show the receipt of what God said. Thank you. Until he comes is the Greek word erchomai, E-R-C-H-O-M-A-I. It means to come. It means to come from one place to another. It means to appear. It means to make one's appearance. It means to come before the public. It's talking about manifestation. Whatever you're believing for, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show that the debt's been paid in full until he comes in manifestation of resurrection life and you receive your answer. Glory. Glory to God. Glory to God. Until he comes from that dimension into this dimension. You keep proclaiming his death. That his death says, there's nothing between me and God. There's no sin between me and God. Even if I've just missed it, Jesus paid for it all. And I'm going to keep remembering his, his body and his blood until he comes, until he manifests resurrection life in that area. You can't have resurrection until there's been a death. That's why you're showing his death. Who are you showing it to? The spiritual realm. It's been paid in full. And I have a right to respect res re expect resurrection life in this area. <laughs> For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're showing who? The principalities and powers. You're showing the spiritual world that the debt's paid in full. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I'm a new covenant saint. I've been changed by grace. I'm loved. I'm in the family. I'm not the son of God, but I'm a son of God. I'm in Christ, and as Jesus is, so am I in this world. That's a reality. I'm going to show you his death until he manifests in resurrection life in my life. Amen. <laughs> My word. <laughs> Metaphorically, this word, until he comes, listen to this, means to come into being. Until he comes into being in that area. It means to arise. Arise, shine, for thy light has come. It means to come forth. Oh, it gets so good. It means to show itself. It means to find place or influence. It means to find place or influence. 
I show the Lord's death through partaking of what he did in his death. In his, in his death, I show that death until he's able to come and find place or influence in my life in that area. You know, sometimes people say things to me and say, man, you can take communion and remind yourself this is about what Jesus did. And it's not, listen, I, it's, I'm all about the physical act of taking communion done in faith. I'm all about that. But we can constantly be remembering the debt's been paid. The debt's been paid. I'm showing the, the principalities and powers. Listen, it's been paid. I heard a man of God say years ago, he says, you want to make a lot of money? Just buy up every haunted house you can buy. And go in there and just take communion. And proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Them demons will run. Ooh, glory. glory to God. Look at this. It means to find place or influence. It means to be established. You show the Lord's death until he's established in resurrection life. Philippians chapter 3, Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Amen. Wait a minute, Chris. You're talking about death. See, there can't be resurrection life until you first recognize the death that paid the price for what separated you from God. And what separated you from God is your sins. And that's been dealt with. Amen. Hmm. Glory to God, that's hot stuff. I mean, I get so excited, I can't stand it. It means to be established. It means to become known. It means to come or fall into or unto. And there it is. Until he comes into our situation. You show his death until he comes into our situation with resurrection life. In order for a resurrection to be experienced, there must first be death. We must first recognize that. Now look, go back up to verse 27. Next verse. Wherefore, whosoever shall take this bread and drink this cup, well, this is so powerful, unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now, this is so tragic because we've made this about us. And we made it about, listen, can I, I'm going to drop something on you. I know you might not want to hear this, but it's reality. In and of ourselves, every one of us is unworthy. That's why we don't do it in remembrance of us. I didn't go to the cross for you. I wouldn't have been a perfect sacrifice. You didn't go to the cross for me. The perfect sacrifice did. Now watch this. Taking it unworthily is when you do it in remembrance of you instead of remembrance of him. This is an adverb, not an adjective. It describes the action, not uh, the person. Now watch this. Unworthily is the Greek word means in an unworthy manner. Look it up. An adverb, it means in an unworthy manner. An unworthy manner is when you make it about you. Now, now once again, we're, we're, we're talking about the act of taking communion, but we're also talking about just in general, remembering what did his death accomplish? You know, um, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, what, remember what they did? They showed, sowed fig leaves, right? Fig leaves were bloodless. God killed an animal. Whenever there's always a, a requirement for sin, and it's shed blood, it's blood. See, but how many know Jesus shed his blood for us? There was a death that took place. So now we can expect a life to arise in our situation. Now watch this. Exam uh, next verse. And the word, the word there, uh, but let, let us examine, watch this, let us examine, let, let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now leave this up here. The word examine me, it, 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 it's a word. It means to test, to examine, to prove, to scrutinize, to see whether a thing is genuine or not. Make sure that your faith is in Him and not you. That's it. That's it. And not you. That's, that's what we have to look at. Amen. But you don't understand. Don't look at you. Don't look at you good. Don't look at your bad. Look completely at Him. That's a fight. Well, I've been doing pretty good, Lord. How many people? Let me give you an example. Thank you. Let me give you an example. How many people have made deals with God? Lord, if you'll do this, I'll do this. Right? It ain't about that. It's about the blood of Jesus. You know what God recognizes? The blood of His Son. Amen. Watch this. And, and, and it means to, screw, to see whether the thing is genuine. It has to do with examination, to approve, or to deem worthy. There's only one that was worthy. His name is Jesus. This is in the present tense, which means it's a continuous, ongoing action. It's in the imperative mood, which means it is imperative. It's necessary. It's a mandate. It's a commandment. You have to do it this way, or you're doing it unworthily. You're making it about you and not him. All right, now, moving right along. Next verse. Just about done. 
The one thing I wanted to get done uh, was until he comes. That was the one thing. And here's the other thing. There's some other definitions here, by the way, if you want to look on the back. But he that eateth and drinketh, what about 29, unworthily eateth and drinketh, once again, that's the action, not the person. He drinks damnation, that's Old English, and it has to do with judgment. What judgment is he, does, he, does he receive? The judgment that's already on this world. Now look at this. This is the other point I was after. Not discerning the Lord's body. You know what I thought that was for years until just last week? I'll tell you what I thought it was. I thought it was discerning between the body and blood. That's not what he's talking about. How many of the blood came from the body? It's discerning and separating the body of Jesus, which contained his body and blood, from the contamination and the filth of this world. In other words, it's taking it in a worthy manner, knowing that what his body contained was a broken body and a shed blood, and I'm separating it from the profaneness of this world. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. Look at the judgment. The judgment that people, look at the top of, the, of this page, which is page six. It means the sentence of a judge. It means the punishment with which one is sentenced. It means the condemn, condemnatory sentence. It means penal judgment. In other words, uh, the, the, what we deserved because of sin. It means a matter to be judicially decided. A lawsuit. A lawsuit. That's why when you go to 1 Peter chapter 5, let's go there. I think I have it wrote down somewhere. There it is. Yeah, 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's look at verse 8. When it says in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 29, I want to give it to you. When it, it talks about discerning. The word discerning means to separate, to make a distinction, to make a distinction. Are you distinguishing or separating the body of Jesus Christ, which contained, of course, his body and his shed blood from the things of the world? Are you making a separation? Or are you just thinking it's just a common thing? You know, in the Old Testament, they profaned the Sabbath. They profaned the sanctuary. They profaned all kinds of things. What does that mean? They didn't count it separate from the things of the world. They didn't make it separate. You know why they couldn't do any work on the Sabbath? Anybody ever think of these things? Anybody know why? You know, before the law, they did all kinds of stuff. Once the law came in, a man was picking up sticks on the Sabbath and they killed the guy. What is the boy talk about hard? You know, we experience death. Our Sabbath is Jesus. It's not a physical day. We profane it. We, we profane Jesus when we try to add what we do to what he did. That's profaning our Sabbath. And when we don't distinguish between the body of Christ, which produced his shed blood from the things of the world, and we just take it like I'm eating a cracker and a piece of juice or whatever, uh, it doesn't mean that much. We are not distinguishing the body of Christ from this world. You have a right. When it says judgment, there's a judgment on this world called sickness, called accidents, called sin, all those things. You have a right to expect. I don't have to go through that. Amen. Oh, Chris, who do you think you are? I think I who he said he, I am. I have a right to not go through that. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Ephesians 5.16, remember that? You remember that? He said the days are evil, but I want you to redeem your time so your days aren't evil. Somebody get happy. God is good. And then you've got some meathead churches teaching that, well, God put that on you. God don't put bad things on you. He redeemed you from them. But look at this. Be sober. <laughs> That's not just talking about alcohol, people. It means be of an alert mind. Be of an alert mind. Why? Because, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, who's not a roaring lion, but he goes about as a roaring lion, walks about seeking who he may devour. Who are those that he devour? Those who are to accept his accusations. Look at this. It's in your outline. The word adversary means an opponent at a suit of law. See, when you just show your receipt, you show, man, his death, said there's nothing separating me and God Almighty. His death allows me to become a son. And I've been raised and seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And when the adversary comes along, you proclaim, you declare what it accomplished. And you do show the Lord's death until he comes in resurrection life and manifest himself in your situation. And you receive the answer to what you're believing for. And guess what? The Father's glorified that you bear much answered prayer fruit. Glory to God, I'm done.
Hallelujah, Jesus. You he said, if we would judge ourselves, I just want to do this. I'm not going back there. Just do the bottom one. I guess I'm not done. Be judged. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. The word be judged means to be judged, to be summoned to a trial. If we would judge ourselves and make sure our faith is in what he did and not in what we're doing, we wouldn't be summoned to the adversary's trial. Say, no thanks, I'm not participating. I've already been judged. I don't have to listen to your mouth. He goes about seeking whom he may devour. It's what he does. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Overcome what? His lies. Amen. Now watch this. It says, if we would, not, if we would judge ourselves, make sure our faith is in him, show his death till he comes in resurrection life, till he manifests, we would not be judged, summons to a trial that one's case, or for one's case to be examined and judgment passed upon it. It's already been passed upon it. It's already been passed upon it. It means to pronounce judgment. It means to go to law. Or it means to have a suit of law, at law. Isn't that something? If we would judge ourselves, if we would show our redemption receipt, we would not be summoned to Satan's courtroom and listen to his false accusations. Talk about fake news. Amen? Amen. Amen. Fake news. Amen. Amen? Don't accept Satan's fake news. Accept the truth. What Jesus Christ says about who you are in Him. Start rejoicing. Start lifting up your hands. When the enemy comes at you and you, all these lies come at you and I feel this and I feel that, say, I don't go by my feelings. I'm not going to exalt my opinion above the Word of God. Another thing we talked about Thursday night, and I'll close with this. Many people lean to their own understanding and don't even know it. What do you mean by that? Well, the Word of God says this, and we'll believe the Word of God as long as it doesn't disagree with what I already believe. But whenever the Word of God stretches me beyond where I believe and says, listen, I know you don't feel like rejoicing, Rejoicing, but the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And if I reject that for my own feelings of self-pity or whatever it is, I'm actually exalting my opinion above the Word of God. I'm leaning to my own understanding and He cannot come in resurrection life in that area. Hallelujah. Praise God. I think we're done. <laughs> Give the Lord a hand.